man is doing an amazing work. Amen. Amen. Personally, I honor him. I honor the grace that he carries. He is still hidden. Most people don't know about him. But this man is a great, great, great resource in the body of Christ. Amen. Great resource in the body of Christ. Amen. And so we are praying that even from today, that doors are opening for this man. Amen. 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 Praise. He is a blessing. He has blessed my life. Amen. Amen. He has blessed my life. He is my friend and he has blessed my life. So the man that is coming to speak to us this morning is a married man. He is a brother just like you. This man is the founder of Success, Success Age and the School of Authentic Living. This man is a disciple of Jesus Christ and he's a great blessing. So the man that is coming to speak to us is called Boniface Nyoike. So I want us to put our hands together as we receive the gift of God. Amen. Amen. Are you well this morning? Yes. Good morning, men. Good morning. How are you? Yes. Say, I am a blessed man. Say, I'm a blessed man. I'm a blessed man. Say again, I'm a, I'm a blessed man. One more time, say, I am, I am a blessed man. Now look at your neighbor and tell them, you are a blessed man. Blessed man. And nothing can change that. Can change Amen. Amen. Uh, you may have your seat. I honor my good friend, uh, Reverend Ben Okeo. Uh, he's a wonderful, wonderful friend to me. And uh, it's always a blessing to just share with him. We have long conversations. You know, you know the way, what to wanna say manga? Wanaume wanaga maneno. Sometimes we sit with him, we talk for three hours, we talk for long, long uh, extended periods of time. And it's always very refreshing just to be able to uh, connect with him and to be able to interact with him, uh, he's a blessing to me. Um, I am honored once again to come and share with you. I'm not going to be very long. I am going to be, uh, try to be short, but I want to put something in your hands that I believe is going to be a blessing to you as a man. And I want you to take some good notes. I want you to take some good notes. If you have a Bible, you can turn to 1 Corinthians 15.45. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 45. We are talking about image and identity. We are talking about image and identity. And I want to begin there because in those words of Paul, in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, you find him saying something very interesting. He says, thus it is written, the first Adam became a living being, the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. It's interesting that the Bible does not have two Eves, but there are two Adams. And that should tell you something, that God is interested in restoring the image and the identity of a man. That when Jesus came on the earth, he didn't come as the second Eve, but he came not just as the second Adam, he came as the last Adam. When God created the first Adam, the first Adam was supposed to be the model of masculinity. But when the first Adam fails, then now God brings Christ to become the last Adam. In other words, God says, this is the last blueprint that you need for you to become the man that God has created you to be. I want us to read one more verse, uh, Colossians 1.15. Colossians 1.15. Um, this is an interesting portion of scripture. Also, it says in Colossians 1.15 that Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Christ is the invisible image of the invisible God. That's an interesting uh, portion of scripture there. So, 
I'm going to share for, from those two passages of scripture. And I believe that by the time we are done, you're going to understand your identity and you will never be defined again by your environment. Because when you understand your identity, then you define your environment instead of your environment defining you. I want to begin by giving you a story that happened in China. So in China, there was a very big, uh, what is it called? A statue that was standing somewhere in the middle of the road. And so one time, they decided that they wanted to build a road there. This thing was, uh, the statue was made of clay. Yeah, And so when they decided to build this road, they decided we want to move this statue to a different place. And so they came, they came with a mkokoteni, wakachukua yo, uh, the statue, wakaekelea kwa mkokoteni, and they started transporting it. As they were transporting it, night fell on them, and uh, they had to park the mkokoteni and the cart somewhere behind, uh, beside the road so that now they can spend the night and wait for the next morning to wake up and continue with the journey. As they are sitting there in the middle of the night, the statute began to crack. Remember, it was made of clay, but it began to crack. And one of the guys woke up in the middle of the night and he looks at the statue and inside the cracks he sees a yellow light coming from the cracks. And the thing continued to crack. And the more it was cracking, the more the rays from the moon were hitting the golden image that was inside that statue. And it was shining and shining and shining. By the time morning came, the whole thing had fragmented and behind the clay, they realized there was a golden statue that was worth millions, but it was hiding behind the clay. What do I say that to say? I say that to ask you a question. By the time your life is done as a man, by the time your life is over as a man, are people going to realize that there was a golden image, there was a golden identity inside you, or are they going to actually realize that you looked like gold on the outside, but the more life faded, they realized you were gold-plated and you were clay on the inside? When God created a man, he gave him an identity. And that identity is what I want to speak to. And I want to tell you that the older you grow, if your identity is genuine, your gold shines forth from the inside. Would you want to say a big amen? Once again, say amen. <laughs> tell your neighbor, are you gold-plated or are you gold on the inside? Ask them as a man. Are you gold-plated or are you, go, uh, are you gold as a man, right? All right. Thank you. Thank you for this. Yeah. So I want to begin by just giving you an analysis of how it is that men have gotten to a place where instead of having gold on the inside, men are trying to have gold in their bank accounts. Now, let me tell you something. Your identity is what remains of you when you're stripped off of all externals. I was asking some men recently, if today you were told by a doctor you will no longer be able to function sexually, would you still believe you're a man? If you wouldn't, then you've not discovered the gold on the inside. If you were told today that the level of uh, wealth or finances that you have is the highest you will ever have, would you still feel like a man? If you haven't, then you have not found your identity. When you find your identity, you locate your value and you no longer need valuables to define you because when your value is discovered, valuables become accessories. They don't become the source of your identity. Tell your neighbor, you don't need money to be a man. You just need to discover your identity. Just need to discover your identity. So there are four things that happen that erode the identity of a man. And I want to begin there so that now I can go to talking about what is the identity of a man. By the way, there are four lies that men believe that allow them to lose that golden identity that God has given them. And you find that in the book of Matthew chapter 4 when Jesus is tempted. Number one, there are men that equate manhood to possessions. 
So when they have possessions, they feel like they are more masculine. They feel, and it's amazing how this disease has crept even into the church. But even when we are embracing men into leadership, the first question is not, what wisdom do you carry? The first question is, what is in your wallet? Because we are defining men by their possessions. There is a story of a man in Job chapter 1. In Job chapter 1, he's the richest man. He's the greatest man in the east. And then the devil and God have a conversation. And the next thing he knows, he loses everything. And even his wife who used to believe him in his identity stops believing in him. And he tells him, curse God and die. When your possessions are removed, what remains of your person is your identity. It's amazing how when men go for tea parties, wanaume wanaendaga unatoa ufunguo ya Range Rover unaekelea hapo juu. One time I was having a, you know, I went for a meeting and, and it's amazing how this affects all of us, you know. Uh, it's amazing how when you buy a car, your car key can no longer fit in your pocket. It has to be on top of the table. <laughs> Angalia jirani yako mbio weka tu kifungo kwa mfuko itatoshia tu itatoshia tu <laughs> You are not what you own Now when Jesus was being tempted he was told if you bow down and worship me I will give you all this and remember the question that the enemy kept repeating is that if you are the son of God if you are the man you claim that you are you will be defined by possessions Now let me tell you something when you die and they put you in a mug and they are burying you there is nothing that you own that will accompany you so you better stop building identity on ownership and start building identity on sonship wow it's amazing that when Jesus was being tempted, he's being told, if you are the son of God. And the next thing that happens, when you read the book of John, when Jesus goes to be baptized and, and he's immersed in the water, when he rises up, before he does any miracle, before he performs any act that validates his masculinity, God looks from heaven and he says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased with. Your identity is that part of you that pleases God because it reflects his image and his likeness. That's your identity. Possessions. You know how many men commit suicide when they lose possessions? I was reading the story of a, of a, of a man in Nyeri where there are extreme suicide cases of men. And this guy was owing somebody 30,000 shillings. And he tried to pay, and he tried to pay, and when he realized he couldn't pay, he went and he took his life because his identity was tied to the ability to pay a debt. What a sorry state. <laughs> you are not what you own. By the way, when they put that cap on Tiger Woods' head, yeah? It is not the cup that gives him value. But the moment he puts it, the cup on top of his head, because he's Tiger Woods, the worth of that cup goes up. Let me tell you, God created you to have an identity where what you own gets value from who you are. You don't get value from what you own. Possessions. It's amazing how many men are trapped in the trap of possessions. Do you know why betting is a big industry? Because men are defined by possession. Do you know, the day you no longer need to be defined by possession, it will be very easy for you to break an addiction to betting. Addictions to accumulation are proof of a hollow identity. Possessions. Number two thing that men define themselves by. And these are things that you will find. The culture, the society is cramming them on us. We are made, being made to believe that we are not men when we don't have th these things. But let me tell you, manhood does not begin with external valuables. Manhood begins with internal value. Internal value. 
when you discover your internal value, everything on the outside becomes an addition. A big ministry becomes an addition. It's amazing that you can even be a minister and because you've not been able to gather a crowd, you feel less of a man because you are still externally defined. Number two thing that defines men nowadays and is causing men to lose their ability to walk in the identity God gave them is what I call performance. Performance, yeah? Jesus was told by the devil, if you are the son of God, turn these stones to bread. In other words, validate your identity by your performance. Try to do something that looks masculine for you to prove that you're masculine. And that's why I asked you a question. Today, if somehow, God forbid, you are not able to function sexually or your wife's income exceeded yours, would you still believe in your role or is your leadership so tied on possessions that you cannot feel like a leader when you don't have them? By the way, a leader does not begin with the performance of a person. It begins with a certain disposition. A person, a certain infrastructure on the inside that makes him lead himself well to begin with. Performance. <laughs> Performance. Right? Performance. One time, uh, I remember a gentleman coming and asking me, you know, Boni, you say you're a man and, and you say that you are an authentic man. What do you have to show for it in terms of performance? Yeah? How many things have you achieved? How many times have you been clapped for? How many times have you been trending? You see, all these things are tied to external validations that are pointing to internal emptiness in men. And guess what? God wants to bring men back to a place where it is not your performance. And let me tell you something interesting. So when I got married, I got married quite early. I got married at age 24. Right? I got married when I was 24 years. And my wife was 23. And she was earning quite a bit. In fact, almost three times what I was earning. And you know, any time we would start having conflicts, tunaza kujibizana, you know I'm from Moranga and my wife is from Kiambu. And when Moranga and Kiambu meet, that's not a very good encounter. <laughs> so you know what used to happen? Any time there was a disagreement... Anytime there was a conflict and we couldn't resolve it, I went back to the reason you are disrespecting me is because I don't have money. So I have to work hard and perform and get money to earn honor. Let me tell you, any person that does not honor your person without money will never honor your leadership when you get money. And even if they honor, it will be counterfeit honor. <laughs> So I was there and, and we were having this tag and pull and tag and pull until one day God told me, you know what? Your problem is not a money problem. Your problem is not a valuables problem. Your problem is an identity problem. And when you fix it, and there are three things that fix the identity of a man. Number one is sonship. Number two is worship. Number three is wisdom. <laughs> when those three things are functional in your life, your value can no longer be contested. You overcome inferiority effortlessly when your identity becomes clarified scripturally. Wow. Performance. Tell your neighbor, watch an anasoria performance. Watch akushinda anawatu. Do you know how many people are under pressure to perform a certain thing to prove that they are what they claim to, to, to be? Yeah? Performance pressure. Nowadays, society is putting men under pressure. Banks are telling you, usikae kaume hangaishwa, kila wakati unakimbizana na nduthi, unapigia mtu wa nduthi, amekataa kuja, chukua loan, prove that you are a man, drive a car like every other man. And let me tell you something, when you get into the trap of performance, it means you're operating on an illegitimate identity. You don't do so that you can become. You do because of who you are. <laughs> wow. Tell your neighbor performance. Performance pressure. Performance pressure. Yeah? It's not even helping. Even in the workplace, they are putting you under performance contract. 
You know, the enemy is very smart. Eh? He knows where men try to derive value. So he creates barricades from that hinder them from operating in the divine identity of God. So what happens? When you don't achieve your performance contract, they suck you, they cut you off, and then you go home feeling like you're a failure, and what you failed to meet was their standard. It is not the standard that God has for you. You go home feeling like a failure, you go home feeling like a nobody, and they make sure they suck you during lunch hour. Unaenda lunch, unapewa baroki, enda lunch, and then unaenda ukiendanga, how rudy. And then people are wondering, you know, so-and-so has gone out for lunch and is not yet back, and they are told he did not reach his performance target. Let me tell you something. You don't need to perform to become a man. You need to become a man, and then you will be empowered to perform. Performance. Performance is a dangerous thing. And if you're not careful, you can give your wife a script that causes her to put you under pressure to perform. I remember again when we got married, you know, and my wife was going visiting her friends. You know, we are young in marriage. She's going around visiting her friends. And now we have a fridge. You know, this fridge is in Caribbean. It's a fridge that you can use to use. And we have this fridge and then we have a home. Kwetu, there is nothing, anything close to that is not there. So she comes and she starts putting me under this pressure. I need this. I need that. I told her, you know what? Men are in sizes and prosperity is in seasons. I don't need to become them. I don't need to run their race. I run my race by God's grace. And I walk my journey as a man. Performance. Performance. Some of you have set precedence. Young men who are dating, you are allowing young ladies to put you under pressure. Unaenda, umechukua mshwari, umechukua mpesa, umechukua fuliza, because you are trying to impress. Let me tell you something. The harder you impress, the more broken you prove your identity is. <laughs> you know, when you discover your identity in God, you have nothing to prove, you have nothing to lose, and you have nothing to fear. You just live your life from a place of contentment, not from a place of competition. See, this is why Paul says, I have learned in all things to be content. Whether I have or I don't have, my masculinity is not tied to having and it is not affected by not having. It is solid, it is sonship-centered and Christocentric. Number three thing that defiles the identity of men is something I call passions. Passions. I am what I feel. Do you know Anytime, anything you attach behind the words I am, you become. That's why Jesus was continually refusing to be defined by his environment. Listen to him. I am the light of the world. They tell him, you are casting out demons in the name of Beelzebub. I am the light of the world. I am the, I am the resurrection and the light. He continually affirmed his identity outside the scope of what he was feeling. Did you know that being depressed is a feeling, but staying depressed is a decision. One time David came and all his wives and children had been taken away and everybody rose up against him. By the way, you have not led until your teammates become your enemies. You've not led. <laughs> Those of you who aspire leadership, tell your neighbor, leadership, you need an identity to stand. Hmm? You have not led until people who came clapping for you and telling you you are the man and calling you Mweshimiwa. I was watching an interesting story in Machakos here where a guy was running for MCA. And before the elections came, everybody was calling him Boss, Mweshimiwa, Champe, all those wonderful names, Bazu. And then the elections came and the guy couldn't garner even 500 votes. He went back on media and started ranting and ranting. They were calling me this. You see, the problem is not what what they were calling you. The problem is that you chose to play to the script of their words and not to the script of God's word. So the guy sank into depression. He said, I will never run again. Let me tell you, if you must cry, cry for a reason worth crying for. Passions. 
passions. <laughs> Tell your neighbor passions. You're not defined by your passions. You know, men who sleep around and men who don't sleep around, the difference is not the level of sexual drive. The difference is identity. The difference is identity. Joseph is in a Delilah moment with Potiphar's wife. And he, the wife comes and amwambia boss, ata wona jo kona feelings. Usi jifanye mawe, ata wona jo avila wanaume muna kuanga, ata wona jo avila wanaume muna penanga. And Joseph looks at him and says, my identity is not my feelings. I don't live based on the script of my feelings. I live based on the script of my sonship. What is this wicked thing you want me to do against my God? You see, when you don't have an identity, you will respond to a Potiphar's wife moment like you are singing praises for a Delilah. <laughs> passions. If you can't rule your passions, the Bible says, he who cannot control his passions is a wasted man. Your passions. God will not kill all the beautiful ladies so that we can live pure, right? He will not. They will be born every day. But there has to be something in you that rises and says, I feel it, but I'm not my feeling. I feel it, but I'm not that sexual urge. And I can subdue it. You see, identity gives you a capacity to subdue an intense emotion. Identity. Identity. Passions. Passions. <laughs> it's amazing what will happen in your life. Let me tell you, the quickest way to change your life as a man, quit living by passions. Quit living for possessions. Quit living for positions. Begin to cultivate your inner world and to align your identity with God. Daniel goes to Babylon and Daniel gives us a pattern of how men's identity are corrupted. So Daniel is taken to Babylon and he's a sharp guy. You know, kuna watu wanakuwa ga sharp naturally. Ask the man next to you, are you a sharp man? Have you been sharpening your manhood? Eh? By the way, nobody is born sharp. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. So iron is not born sharpened, it is sharpened by another iron. Wow. <laughs> so Daniel goes to Babylon and there is a, a pattern that you see that corrupts the identity of men in every generation. Number one, that pattern begins with deception. You believe a lie. You believe a lie about what it means to be a man. You believe a lie about what defines a man. You believe a lie about what gives meaning to being a man. You believe a lie. And let me tell you, what you believe, you will live. Right now, people are saying we are in a bottom-up economy. The economy is hard. Let me tell you, the economy will align to your belief system. Do you know there are people who are becoming millionaires in this economy without stealing? Would you look at the man next to you and tell them, you can be one of those men. Just tell them, you can be one of those men. Just tell them, you can be one of those men. You can rise up when people are going down. But the, you've got to resist deception. And let me tell you, one of the biggest avenues of deception is the media. Let me tell you how deceptive the media is. I was reading a research on the evolution of LGBT and the scientist by the way, the scientist who did this experiment was an atheist. So they cannot say he was a Christian so he corrupted it. So they were doing an experiment to determine whether there is a gene, whether there is a chemical in the human body that is responsible for gay behavior. They discovered there is none. But you know what they did? They kept that information from media. Wow. When Jesus died, and he was about to resurrect, and he resurrected, the media was paid, and they were told, go and say his body was stolen. That's how the media operates. They are an industry that is financed to mass market a lie. This is a, this is a person 
who was an atheist. He discovered that. But you know what all the rich people who wanted to live in their perversion did? They brought their billions together and they kept that report from ever accessing the public. Because when people know the truth, John 8, 31 to 32, if you continue in my word, you shall know the truth. And when you know the truth, the truth will set you free. I was talking to a man recently, some years back, and this man had gotten into gay behavior. He believed a lie. He got into gay behavior. And you know what he did? Because he didn't want to confront it and to conquer it, he decided to marry as a cover-up. See, this is how you know you are living in deception. You manage your reputation by cover-ups. Ayoliza jirani yako. Tukijua ukweli juu yako. Tutasema nini? Muliza tutasema nini? Cover-ups. When David slept with Bathsheba, cover-up. <laughs> it's amazing how we value reputation more than we value identity. Identity is who you are. So this guy goes ahead, he marries, and they get children, and they begin raising children. Everything is going well until his son becomes a teenager. And you know what happens? He begins having a gay attraction towards his own son. See how deception works? He begins having a gay attraction towards his own son. He begins a relationship with his son. He begins sleeping with his son. Now, let me tell you the saddest part. This man is not a pervert somewhere in a bar. He's an elder that sits on the front row of the church, but he's sitting at the back row of truth. So, we decided, he called me up, reached out to me, said, come, Let's talk. Let's see how we can help you to build a capacity to overcome that. I went and I waited for him in a hotel. Waited for one hour, two hours, three hours. The man never showed up. You know why? It is more convenient to cover up than to rediscover your identity and fight for your freedom. Deception. Deception. Do you know how many men are deceived that I was... And, and let me tell you why I share these stories. Because I share with them to show you how corrupted you can become if you don't keep watch on the gates of your heart as a man and decide, I will not allow deception to enter into my heart. <laughs> so, there was this other guy. He's a good guy, wonderful man, has a wonderful family. He walks one day and he sees a billboard, massage parlor in Karen. If you are tired and you need a relaxing moment, a what? A relaxing moment. Come over. We have the perfect service for you. So what does he do? He puts fuel on his car. He drives all the way to Karen, uses Google Maps, and it's amazing how we are strategic about perversion, but we are not as strategic about progress. So he goes, gets to Karen, gets on this bed, Lady comes, begins allowing him to relax, allowing him to have the moment of his life. And the day he's sharing that story with me, he tells me that this woman did for me what my wife has never done for me. I got an experience, an adventure that I've never felt in my own life. And now he's beginning to be defined by his passions. And let me tell you, passion will never give you an accurate identity. It will always give you a counterfeit identity. So, first time, he goes home. His wife finds out he forgets a condom in the car. Second time, he forgets a certain gel in the car. And he continues being caught. And the wake-up moment is when he's told, this is your last chance to redeem yourself. Or else this marriage goes up in flames. Deception. Let me tell you. Deception is all around us. And it is fighting for one thing. It is fighting for your identity. Because when your identity is corrupted by deception, everything about your life will follow the pattern of that deception. Deception. Number two. So you just hear a lie that sounds good. It's not, it doesn't sound very bad and very evil. One time, I was working in the government 
and you've never worked in a deceptive place until you work for the government. And I was working where there was, we were handling a lot of money, and you know, in our, I, I was a team leader in a section where I was the only Kikuyu, and then there were several other multifaceted tribes. So, Jama Moja can decide, kwa nini tu kayapa tu mesota, na pesa ya serikali kwa hapa, na pesa ya serikali na ibiwangwa kila siku. So the guy decides to steal, and stealing, he does. He takes money, and then I discover, and being a good Kenyan like Daniel, I am trying to resist defilement. I do a report, and I take it to the CEO. I report. So let me tell you what happens in Kenya when you report a crime like that. Eh? Yeah, whistleblower. You better have identity before you are a whistleblower. Just tell them, you better have identity. You better have identity. <laughs> So you know what happened? I reported and in two weeks I was given an interdiction letter. And you know why I was given an interdiction letter? Pesa ikipotea na kwa watu wote kuna mkikuyu mmoja. Who is the first suspect? <laughs> so two weeks later I was given a letter to go home. I'd been invited by one of the churches to speak here uh, in Westlands. And, and one of the managers in our company, of course, the line now begins to go round. Oh, Boni, anajifanyanga preacher. Na ye ni mwizi. Oh, da, da, da. So my poster was in a certain flyer. And the manager went and told the pastor, you are inviting this guy, and this guy is already under investigation for being a thief. Worse to it. We had consolidated some few coins with my wife. We had bought our first car, KBH355J. The same time when I'm being interdicted, my mother calls me. She says, Na wewe unasema ujaiba pesa, na naona umenunua gari. Gari, pesa, kupotea, wewe. What is the lie in here? Here is the worst thing that happened. I never thought I would appear on the front page of a daily newspaper for something that I didn't do. People daily, my name appeared there. Being investigated. For what? For stealing, em they call it embezzling government resources. But let me tell you one thing about identity. When your identity is clear and your integrity is intact, your reputation does not steal your peace. You sleep like a baby because your softest pillow is a clear conscience. <laughs> so, you know what happens? Diet. Information. A lie is repeated so many times, we begin to believe it. Do you know, it doesn't take much to destroy a generation. Do you know all it takes to destroy a generation of men? Just take one lie and repeat it all over again. Use the most creative ways to repeat it until the minds of the people believe it. People don't believe what is true. People believe what is repeated. <laughs> it is true that you love your wife, right? But do you know the only way she'll believe it? If you repeat it. I told you that I love you. And the day I change my mind, I will be fair enough to let you know. Diet. The first thing Daniel was told to change his name. The second thing, he's given the food of the king. And let me tell you something. A lot of what are lies come from kings. When the enemy wants you to be corrupted, he sends a lie through a voice you are predisposed to trust. To trust. Who do you trust as a man? See, this is why you must stay with the word. Because the word is the only thing that can help you to escape the lies that are there to corrupt your identity. So it begins with deception, it goes to diet. Number three, it goes to defilement. Defilement. Do you know once you believe a lie, what begins to happen? You begin to live that lie. What is defilement? Defilement is when the lie in your mind becomes a behavior in your life. Defilement. You become defiled. You become defiled. Yeah? You used to believe in monogamy. 
all of a sudden, you begin believing, hey, by the way, even Abraham slept with another girl there. Even David had several wives. Ata Solomon, the wisest man in the world, alikuwa na wanawake elfu moja. Mimi natafuta watatu tu, na watu wanawana nika nimefanya makosa kubwa sana. You know, when you get to the place of defilement, you even use scriptures to justify irrational behavior. You use scriptures. <laughs> you use scriptures. You get to a place of defilement. This thing about identity. And then after defilement, you get to a place where you are disconnected from your identity. So it begins with deception. You believe a lie. It goes to diet. You are fed with information that causes you to believe that lie. You go to defilement where now your behavior begins to be corroded by lies and then you go to a place called disconnection. You are disconnected from the truth and you don't even know it. This is the story of Samson for you, eh? Samson alianza tu pole pole. Akaona msichana anaitwa Delaila. Eh hey, akasikia, eh hey, kuna vile roho imeanza kuchemka, kuna vile damu inakimbia and he was feeling like I need to prove that I'm a man. He continues on. One day, he didn't know how disconnected he was from power. He said, I will arise and do what I've always done. When you're disconnected, you don't know. You only know when challenges come and expose how disconnected you are. Do you know? You can be disconnected with your wife and you don't know. Did you know that? You can be disconnected with your child and you don't know. Muko, <laughs> huh? tu. I was talking to a man recently. He told me, my wife just decided to wake up and leave. I told him, no, he did not just wake up and leave. That was a moment that was a culmination of a process. But then let me tell you a secret, man. Eh? By the time a woman leaves you, she has been patient with you. Women are not like men. Eh? You know men to decide. We are very logical. One plus one is two. She's been sleeping around and I have evidence for it. End of story. A woman takes her time because she has emotional elasticity. Disconnection. Disconnection. And the last stage is the most dangerous stage where we get to. The last stage is a stage called disillusionment. You are so disconnected from what being a real man is all about until fake looks real and real looks fake. Have you heard of a gentleman called Andrew Kibe in the, in the media? Yeah? Let me say this because it's in, the, it's in the media domain. Yeah. Did you know that Andrew Kibe used to be a pastor? Did you know that? Did you know that this man at one point loved God, lifted his hands and worshipped God, lifted his hands and said, God, I need you? The man that you see today is a byproduct of deception, diet, disconnection. Now he's disillusioned. I was talking to some men recently from my homeland and one Presbyterian minister decided the Bible no longer makes sense. Why? Did, what were we worshipping before the whites came? He said we were worshipping facing the mountain. So he put off his uh, regalia, you know, his clothes and he says I am going back to tradition. He forgot what it means to be a man. Disillusionment. Disillusionment. This is a dangerous place. When you get to this place of disillusionment, you no longer know what you are. You no longer know who you are. And you no longer care about what truth has to say about being a real man. You are disillusioned. David, when he committed sin with Bathsheba, if you read Psalms 32, he said, when I began to process this thing, I covered it up, I, I hatched the perfect plan. You create the perfect plan that you will never be caught. And your perfect plan fails. So David said, Husband, this guy will die and this thing will be forgotten. Then he says, no, let, let's bring this guy home. Let him lie with his wife. Let him impregnate his wife. And, let, and then I'll say, you see, he got pregnant because his husband was around, right? Disillusionment. Your best laid plans will fail if your identity is not accurate. 
is illusionment. Very quickly, let me give you some three things that happen when you, your image is damaged by that process. Very quick thoughts here. Number one, when your image is damaged as a man, you become an insecure man. You become very insecure. You are ruled by fear. You are controlled by anxiety. You never live, you never have a peaceful night. Kila wakati ni kutan tu kwa kitanda. Na hii kitu kipatikana, hii kitu kijulikana, hii deni haijalipwa. You, you become a man that is insecure. If you read the book of Judges chapter 6, you find the story there of Gideon. This man was anxious. He, didn't, he no longer believed in the capacity of God in him. Why? When you are disconnected from your identity in God, you become blind to your capacity in God. Insecurity. Fear. Do you know why Saul was such an insecure leader? He was disconnected. <laughs> he was disconnected from God. Yeah? So a young man arising, kill him. One of the signs that you have a broken identity is that when other people are rising, it bothers you. <laughs> eh? Uliza tu jirani yako. Unaoneleaje ukufikia hapo? Unajoneleaje? When your wife starts earning a little bit more, you start being anxious. Akipigiwa simu ya kazini, unasema, nani nani uyo alikuwa nakupigia? And you said you trusted her. When you are insecure, when other people begin rising, it bothers you. When somebody does a better job than you, it bothers you. When somebody gets a career or a position you thought was supposed to be yours, it bothers you. Why? Your identity is broken. Wow. One time, disciples of Jesus were Jesus, we have found some guys who are casting out demons. They thought Jesus was going to be insecure and saying, who is stealing our ministry now? <laughs> You know the way people say, my ministry was stolen. Hiyo <laughs> opportunity ilikuwa yangu. Hiyo biashara mimi ndio nilikuwa nimefikiria. Let me tell you. Anytime you conceive an idea, it has been proven scientifically. 10,000 people at the same time conceive the same idea. The reward goes to the one who executes first. Ay, identity. Tell your neighbor insecurity. <laughs> insecurity. Oh my, insecurity. Number two, results of a broken image and identity. Not only insecurity, but inferiority. You feel less of yourself as a man. You define yourself by so many external things. You feel less of yourself as a man. You know, when I was growing up in ministry, uh, I used to hold meetings, and then I would go and meet with uh, some of the more established preachers, and they would ask me, so how many people came to your meeting? And then I would begin feeling inferior, say, only seven people came up. You see, leading seven people by truth is harder than leaving 7,000 people by deception. Don't compare yourself. <laughs> Don't compare yourself. Some of the people you're comparing yourself with and feeling inferior about wamekopa madeni ndi wanunue magari we unapanda ndudhi unalipa cash na unaogopa unakuwa inferior just because somebody is driving a piece of metal inferiority inferiority will cause you to undermine yourself and overvalue others who are doing poorer than you inferiority <laughs> wow See, identity is the only thing that cures inferiority. When you discover your identity, you stop having competitors because nobody can beat you at being you. Do you know today if I give you my notes, you cannot preach this message the way I can preach it. You cannot teach it the way I can teach it. You cannot use the illustrations that I use. Why? It is unique to me. When you discover your identity, you tap into your uniqueness. When you tap into your uniqueness, you overcome the tendency to compete. You are incomparable. You know what Reverend Ben is doing? Nobody can do what he's doing. It is unique to him. Right? And the only thing we can do if we are secure and not inferior is to celebrate him. The proof of conquered inferiority is the ability to celebrate another's success. Inferiority. Insecurity, inferiority. Number three, 
when your image is damaged, you are not only insecure or inferior, you are also inconsistent. Have you ever struggled in building consistency in an area? Yeah? Uliamka, mwakampia, ukarejesa kwa gym. Ukasema, e one pack, I am going to turn it to a six pack. I am going to be the next person nikieka picha hivi kwa social media, watu wanajua bazu wa meka picha. Let me tell you something. If your identity is broken, your consistency can never be validated. Consistency. <laughs> Let me tell you, when you see a man that has been with one thing for long, it is because they discovered their identity. When you discover your identity, you stay with your principles. You don't stick with trends, what is popular. You don't sp stick with tradition, what people are going back to. You stay with the truth. That's why the Bible says, return to the old ways and you will find rest for your souls. When you don't return to a consistent pattern of truth, you will live in constant restlessness. Restlessness too. You are never restful. Insecurity, inconsistency, inferiority. Let me finish by giving you a pattern of recovering your image. Very quickly, in two minutes, and then I'll be done. How do we recover our identity as men? Because our identity is key. Number one, you discover your identity by identification. <laughs> identification. What does it mean, identification? You have got to identify with your source. When I was in high school, we were doing a subject called woodwork. And we were, you know, building Vitu Zambao and all that. Now, when you build a table, you don't define it based on the shape. You define it based on the tree where it came from. See, this is why Jesus understood, I am the son of God. When he was being baptized, the father says, you are the son of God. Do you know what? People kept contesting that. But when he died and they lifted him up on the cross, what were the words they said? Surely this man was the son of God. Why? Identification. How did he identify? He said, I do not do anything that I don't see my father do. I identify with the heavenly pattern. If you don't identify with the heavenly pattern, you will have corruption of identity for the rest of your life. The rest of your life. Identification. So you identify with the truth. You stay with the truth. Right? I read the story of one George Muller, an incredible guy. This guy, here is how he discovered what it means to be a man. He would read his Bible on his knees two hours every day. He would walk into somebody's house, kablo mpatie chai, anakwambia, let me read one chapter of the Bible. Before I take your tea, let me read one chapter of the Bible. By the time this man was growing, he became so consolidated in his identity because he identified with the word of God. How many times do you read the word? Amo ukiingia kwa simu yako na inanga kwa bet nasi, sports pesa, all those things. Let me tell you. Corruption of identity is because men have not been identifying with God. Are you a man that will decide, I will identify with God. I will identify with his word. Number two, very quickly. Identification. Number two, modeling. Modeling. <laughs> Allow the truth to mold you. Allow the truth to shape you. Allow the truth to give you a picture of manhood. One of the best games in the world is called chess, yeah? And they say, if you want to become a chess champion, you don't become a chess champion by reading a book. You become a chess champion by playing with a master and modeling after their moves. You play with a master. Jesus is the master. You pattern yourself after his moves. How did he respond to temptation? How did he respond to greed? How did he respond to life? You model the more you model, the more your masculinity comes back to a place of identity. Number three. So number one is identification. Number two is modeling. Number three is alignment. Alignment. You must choose to keep realigning your life. For those of you that uh, own cars, eh? 
or if you've ever driven a car, you've ever heard of something called wheel alignment. Yeah? Wheel alignment means that for that car to function well, there has to be a certain way those wheels are structured. It's called alignment. It's called being straightened to a certain perspective. Alignment restores image. Alignment consolidates identity. When you align with God, you identify with God, you model after God, and then you align with God. And then number four, G, you grow in God. You grow in God. By the way, you become a male by birth, but you become God's man by growth. <laughs> Luke 2.52 says, Jesus grew. He grew. He did not stay in one spot. He grew. And by the way, growth does not happen with the passing of years. It happens with the increase of wisdom in your life. What wisdom have you increased in your life of late? If you're not increasing in wisdom, you're destroying your image. You're destroying your capacity to be the man God wanted you to become. Did you know that a woman is designed to follow wisdom, not gender? Solomon, when he became the wisest man in the world, eh, Queen of Sheba, came from wherever she was to seek the wisdom of Solomon. Why? Wisdom is the currency of leadership. We don't lead by age. We lead by wisdom. If you want to grow as a man, Grow in wisdom first. Grow in understanding. Grow in the truth of God's word. And finally, E. E. Is related to the G. Excellence. Purpose to be a man that never settles. Never park where you are. Keep on reaching for new skies. Keep on reaching for new heights. Daniel chapter 6 and verse number 3. The Bible says a spirit of wisdom was found in Daniel. That this man was an uncommon man. He had the image of God so much that when the kings were reigning, the first king, he allowed Daniel to serve in his government. The second king, he allowed Daniel to serve in his government. The third king, he allowed Daniel to serve in his government. Why? A spirit of excellence was found in him. What is the spirit of excellence? The spirit of God within you refusing to settle for mediocrity. That's the image of God. So how does this all work? Let me say one last thing. Here is how it works. <laughs> you cannot be a man that bears the image of God if you flow with the current. You must flow with the truth. So how does that work out? When the world sits down, you stand up. When the world stands up, you stand out. When the world stands out, you become outstanding. And when the world becomes outstanding, you become the standard because you're carrying the image of God. You're not defined by possessions, positions, or pleasure. You're defined by by your sonship in God. I want us to pray and I want us to just be on our feet for a minute and pray. Just stand up on your feet. Let's pray.